poison someone by using your beauty to trace of poison. Why not just monitor? I guess that's why I know. This is what happens to the Just we'll have a discussion. Uh, 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 Nietzsche Chobnowski, he comes uh, from uh, the Flat Iron Institute in New York City. And he will talk about a similarity alignment, a missing link between structural function and algorithms. All right. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's always a pleasure. So I think there were. Um, enough talks, uh, this workshop already, to convince you that uh, with all the explosion in neuroscience data acquisition from neuronal population activity to connectomics, there is an urgent need for a theory that would explain or account uh, for all these observations, but also relate them to the computation that the brain carries out, right? So what kind of theory could fit this niche? That's what I would like to address in this talk. Now, um, these days, um, can't give a talk without mentioning deep learning. Uh, so um, here is a slide comparing what deep learning networks do. Um, and, and the biological neural networks. Um, so um, one difference is that uh, in most cases, um, the deep learning networks are uh, used in supervised setting. They're trained on huge label data sets. Uh, yet in biology, uh, labeled examples are rare. And um, most of the learning, I think, happens in unsupervised setting with just very few labels. Um, involved. 
So more like maybe a semi-supervised if, if you want to push it or reinforcement learning, but not a supervised setting. So that's one major difference. And the other major difference is that um, in constructing those networks, uh, computer scientists typically don't care whether they're biologically plausible in a sense that they use learning rules um, that are non-local, meaning that the synaptic weight is adjusted based on the activity of a lot of other neurons in the system, not just the two neurons that the synapse connects, which is, of course, the only thing that biology would allow in a real brain, just because physically a synapse has access only to the activity of those two neurons. I can't resist pointing out that you're right about backprop, but the Bolson machine, which also has That's a right. version, is heavier. So it, it's not a, it's not That's a right. um, yeah. I'm it's referring not a, 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 yes. It's, it's an important comment about the current generation that is uh, very efficiently being put to use, but it, it, it's it's not a restriction on being able to do deep learning. Right, um, and also Bolson machine is can be used in unsupervised mode, so that's. Not what I'm comparing. Right. Thanks. Yeah, that's an important. That's an important point. Um, well, so that's why I'm not that enthusiastic about using deep convolutional network as um, that theory that um, connects experiment um, to computation. Uh, even though there is a similarity between the two. Um, Okay, I made the slide before Tali's talk. Okay, so <laughs> now, <laughs> now I would say less poorly understood <laughs> than I thought. Uh, nevertheless, my mathematician colleagues tell me that this kind of similarity is not a good reason to use um, uh, this as a model of that. Um, so um, we would like to uh, come up with an alternative kind of framework. Um, that would be built um, by what we call a normative algorithmic approach. Okay, so we would like to start with some sort of computational objective that is um, motivated by the computational task that the brain performs. So that's the link to computation, right? So we will focus on object categorization, which is what convolutional networks also do. Um, you know, but in unsupervised settings. So it would be clustering in the first part of the talk and manifold learning or disentangling in the second part of the talk. Um, once formulating this objective mathematically, we would like to derive an online algorithm that optimizes this objective. Um, what do I mean by an online algorithm? Well, that's an algorithm which operates in a biological setting, biologically plausible setting, where data is not available all at once. It is streamed to the brain by sensory organs, one sample at a time. And the brain cannot wait too much before computing the output. So the output has to be produced on the fly, in real time, and without requiring large memory storage capacity. Right? So you cannot, like it's done in classical you know, machine learning or statistics algorithm, you cannot load all the data into RAM and crunch it there. That's not a biologically plausible mode, at least not on the level, mechanistic level of individual neurons and microcircuits. Okay, that's the level we're addressing. So the goal is to derive an online algorithm and then to map that algorithm onto a neural network. In some sense, to derive a neural network architecture whose dynamics, both neural activity dynamics and synaptic plasticity, will carry out the steps of the online algorithm. And what's crucial, we will uh, want to ensure that we are not violating the biological requirement on the locality of learning rules that there have been or anti have been only. Okay, so that's kind of our program, and I have to admit that it's not entirely new. You know, even um, in the 90s, um, people have used this kind of approach. You know, uh, one uh, famous example is, of course, Bruna's um, sparse dictionary learning. We are starting with the objective minimizing L1 regularized reconstruction error. Uh, they derived an online algorithm which actually does map onto a neural network, which in some architectures gives local learning rules. Okay, so this um, program has been also followed by other people, um, but what we did differently is we started with a different um, computational objective. 
And um, that allowed us to resolve some problems that existed uh, with um, reconstruction, uh, error minimization approach, but also gave some interesting results that I think is available not just to understand how the brain works, but in general for machine learning. So, what, uh, so um, before I uh, tell you what our approach is, I want to motivate it by showing you an experimental um, result uh, that was obtained by uh, functional MRI in a human inferotemporal cortex. This is a higher visual area. And what they did, they basically showed um, to a subject a uh, 100 different objects uh, and recorded um, neural activity vectors, okay, where component, each component vector is activation of a voxel in uh, fMRI uh, image. And then they computed uh, inner products or correlations between uh, all uh, pairs of such vectors, between pairs of such vectors corresponding to all pairs of the objects. And they filled up this similarity matrix. Okay? So if the two objects produce similar activity patterns in IT, they're shown by a blue pixel, uh, dissimilar activity patterns, they're shown by red pixel. And immediately you can see this log diagonal structure which seems to align with animate and inanimate categories suggesting that um, the activity patterns corresponding to animate objects are more similar to each other than animate to inanimate. Okay? What's the scale of the, I mean, is it is like both dark blue mean like perfect 100% correlation or is this like maximum at 30% correlation? Uh, that's a good question. I don't actually remember. This data is taken from a series of papers by uh, Um You know, I would say um, it's probably, well, okay, here's the way to answer this question. The diagonal, right, shows perfect correlation. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's the color corresponding to one. Well, it shows, I mean, does it show, do you show the same thing twice? I mean, that's the diagonal. Yeah, so there is a little bit of a spread there, too. Uh, I don't remember exactly how much spread there was, um, but, you know, it's pretty high. Okay? Um, anyhow, um, so this is the similarity matrix that was measured in one... Oh, you have a question? Um, so how did they figure out to order the rows and columns in this particular way to see the structure? Oh, so these are these are animate objects? Yeah, but how do you figure out that you should group objects by animate and body face and that sort of stuff? Is well, there have, been, there have been there um, have been there has been prior knowledge that the way those objects are presented may have may have oh, some so separation. Purely on prior knowledge, there's no training of there's no algorithm that you're. No, 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 no. They oh, just. Wow. Yeah, they, they just ordered it basically uh, animate this way and animate that way. They just decided to do it like that. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. There's no training. Uh, Michel, a follow-up question. How, how, how do you measure the similarity of two activities? So this, this is just correlation. So this is just the inner product, normalized inner product. You can also compute distances, um, but yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is the observation. Um, you know, some people find it more surprising than others, but what I think is really amazing is that if you compute the similarity matrix for different individuals, you will get a very similar similarity matrix, even though individual activity patterns in the brains of those individuals that correspond to the same stimulus could be very different, right? Because the neurons between uh, the individuals are not identifiable, there could be even a different number, okay? Yet, the similarity matrix is invariant. And it's so invariant, it's scary, okay? Because this is a similarity matrix from a monkey IT, okay? And it's obtained not by fMRI, if anyone um, doesn't um, take this fMRI evidence seriously, but by single unit electrophysiology. Okay, so this is similarity computed on activity vectors where each component is a firing rate of an individual neuron in IT, of a monkey. And you get pretty much similar structure. And it's a human face for the monkey and not a monkey face. Uh, well, there are both monkey faces and human faces. I, I mean, I'm sure when you zoom into the details, you will see differences here. 
but on the animate and inanimate, I think it's, it's all uh, pretty similar. OK? So I think this is amazing um, that similarity matrices, but not activity patterns, are the invariance between different neural representations of I different individuals. Since uh, that data come out, um, there are some more indication that this is indeed the case. The latest ones are still unpublished works in um, the olfactory system, both in mammals and in vertebrates, uh, which show um, very well that, again, even though activity patterns in piriform cortex or mushroom body may be very different from individual to individual, similarity matrices computed for each individual uh, are invariant. The dimensionality here is different, I suppose. No, the dimensionality is determined by the uh, okay. data set. The but is measured on some vector of... Ah, the internal dimensionality is, of course, very different. How different? You know? uh, I don't know. Um, I think it's probably higher here because they recorded from many neurons because they just, you know, maybe uh, so dozens of neurons. Done, these and here, these are, these are single unit electrode recordings. And the human fMRI. So these are voxels, oh, but IT is not that big. I don't know how many voxels there are. Okay, but I suspect that here the uh, folded dimensionality is slightly bigger. It's a little bit too good to be true. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. But the olfactory. So you can argue because this is not. This is fMRI. Okay, you don't know what happens in those voxels. These are single unit recordings. So you combine from different trials. But the olfactory data that is still unpublished is comes from calcium imaging, so it's a population activity, and it's very hard to argue with it. Okay, so this kind of observation makes you understand why um, thinking about neural representation as a representation of similarities, as was pointed out in a long paper by Shimon Edelman in 98, is a good idea. Okay, if something is invariant, right, that may be something that biology really cares about. Um, so that's kind of the starting point for us. Um, but the question we uh, addressed is, OK, so we're going to use similarity as the neural representation. But the big question is, how do you get that similarity matrix? Right? Because the similarity matrix is not the same in every visual area. Right? This is similarity matrix in IT. right? And if you uh, record uh, activity in V1 in response to the same set of objects, you, of course, don't see the structure because V1 does not care whether the object is animate or inanimate. It cares about edges. And if the edge statistics is um, uh, normalized between animate and inanimate, you won't see much structure. So that's exactly what happened. So how does the brain get, uh, get from this kind of similarity matrix to that kind of similarity matrix? And what I would like to do is to say, OK, if we view neural computation as a transformation of similarity matrix, uh, we can actually make progress. And the zeroth order uh, way to think about it, which might seem a little bit counterintuitive given the previous slide, is what we call similarity alignment. Basically, what you want to do between the inputs and the outputs of a single layer of a neural network is to match um, similar output uh, similar input activity to similar output activity. Okay, so it's like uh, multidimensional scaling or manifold learning. You're trying to preserve distances between nearby stimuli. Of course, what this doesn't tell you what you do with the remote stimuli, and that's where the whole game is played. Okay, and that's why by applying this transformation multiple times, we think you can get from this similarity matrix to that similarity matrix. Um, would it be a, you know, a friendly amendment? Would it be a little uh, more meaningful to think of you know, that, that the computation is uh, transforming, at, uh, you know, achieving similarity between uh, stimuli that are evolutionarily useful to be, uh, to be considered similar? You see what I'm saying? I mean, that, uh, that, um, yeah, so how this came about, 
Right, right. No, no. <coughs> but, but what I'm saying, so you know, is that is that uh, is that uh, I can understand similar uh, in nine million, in nine million because right. this is a incredible. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a very animals and non-animals. Okay, so you know, because that's a fantastic uh, dichotomy. Okay, that it, that has a lot of uh, you know prey and uh, predator is another. Right, you know, right, uh, right. Uh, right. But I mean, sort of, I don't know. Uh, Boring animals, and you know, so you know, may may not be may not be a. I, I agree, but I think that if I really follow this line of questioning, we run into the limitations of unsupervised setting, right? We have to say, well, you can't just like analyze images and get all this stuff out. You have to think about behavioral goals, and it was supervised, I mean, right? Okay. So, but we are not going that far. Okay. For this talk only, we are staying in the supervised an unsupervised setting, and which is probably okay to deal with the first few layers because uh, those representations will be used for all different uh, tasks. I wonder if, so for the figure on the left, yeah. it seems very messy. Yeah. You're using the categories and clusters of high-level objects that are using for the figure on the right. Yeah. So I wonder if you use something like similarities between like edges and oh, yeah. ratings and stuff. You get a very nice yeah, plot. and in fact, I have a plot. I'm sorry, I don't have it in this uh, PowerPoint, but I have a slide showing that if you plot edge orientation uh, similarity, then you get a beautiful two-banded structure, just as you would expect. Yes. So maybe that. I think that what I'm trying to clarify then is that your, your previous slide you said that you're trying, you, you want to map the input similarity in the input space into similarity in the neural space, but here we're seeing similarity in a psychological space. So right. So what, what I want to, yeah, that's, that's confusing. I'm sorry. I know this um, problem exists. What I want to talk about is a transformation taking place in each layer, in one layer only. OK? I don't have a full answer uh, to how stacking those layers will get you from the, there to here, to the psychological similarities. But I think that for a single layer, you can think in zeroth order that you just preserve the distances between nearby objects, OK? But we will see why we think it's likely that this can give you a psychological similarity towards the end of the talk. But it may not be clear. Yes? <coughs> All right? OK. So, um, so let's set up some simple computational problem, right? Since we're talking about categorization, which deep learning, of course, does extremely well. We're going to do it in an unsupervised setting. So in the pixel intensity space, the difference between animate and inanimate objects in the simplest case would be just like this kind of um, two clouds of data that may perhaps be linearly separable. OK, this doesn't have to be the case. The manifolds can be entangled. That's what we deal, we'll deal with part, in part two. But in part one, we will just do unsupervised clustering of this linearly separable data set. Okay? Well, you may think, well, what's the big deal, right? There are tons of clustering algorithms and networks. And um, I would argue that actually none of those existing algorithms, at least the ones that I know of, pass our um, requirements for uh, biological plausibility, right? So these algorithms are mainstay of statistics, of course, but they are all offline, OK? Even if you have online k-means algorithm. Um, for example, like the implementations by these neural networks, you may have uh, something that works online. But when you look at um, the specifics of the winner-take-all dynamics in those networks, they don't really respect the locality of the learning rules. At least that, that's my understanding from reading those papers. So that's why we figured we had uh, to uh, build this from scratch. But whether uh, clustering works online or not depends on the algorithm. Not on the algorithm. Depends on? Essentially, their, their, their online version of k-means for generations. I agree. And, and you know, some sort of a leader algorithm. It just looks at, and, and they work perfectly as when you have well-separated clusters. Yes. And they fail miserably, or they're, they're some, but k-means also fail miserably. Any, all of those algorithms are essentially hard, and NP-hard in the worst case. So, so it's, uh, it's not really clear, I mean, what do you require? Right. So uh, the, there are algorithms that pass the online requirements, but there isn't a neural network with local learning rules. 
so that synapses are only habit and anti-habit, derived from a principled objective. That doesn't exist. That did not exist. In fact, you are correct, and I'll go. I will show you a network that implements k-means online in a biologically plausible way. But we have to work for that. Okay. So, um, right. So, um, okay. So that's why I, I, I will ask you to bear with me a little bit. There is a little bit of an unusual thinking about clustering. Okay. Um, that we had to do so that we generate an objective function that then can lead to an online algorithm and a neural network that has local learning rules. So it may look a little bit weird in the beginning, but um, it basically is very close to k-means. Okay, so what we have is these two clouds of points. We would like uh, to, in the x1, x2 input space, and we would like to generate an output, which is this um, uh, assignment indices that is 1, 0 for red cluster and 0, 1 for the blue cluster. Okay? And we can do it very easily if we think not in a centroid-based way, like you usually do in k-means, but in similarity-based way, sort of like is done in hierarchical clustering maybe. Right? So if the two points are sufficiently similar, right, you want to assign them to the same output vector. If the two points are dissimilar, you want to assign them to different assignment indices, which happen to be orthogonal. This can be easily accomplished by simply thresholding the input similarity. Right? If you think of input similarity as just an <coughs> inner product of the stimuli, uh, stimuli T and tau, then if you threshold it at uh, the threshold at alpha, so that the output is 1 here and 0 here, you will get the desired result. Of course, you would have to choose alpha in a way that um, you know, these points are more similar than alpha and these points are less similar than alpha. But basically, that will achieve this goal, right? Because um, what does, um, you know, what does um, 1 mean for output similarity? Since the norm of this vector has to be 1, it would have to be one of those two, uh, and um, they would have to be aligned. That means you assign them to the same cluster, and zero means you end up in different clusters because the assignment indices are, or assignment vectors are orthogonal. Is that a question? Yeah, just the basic question. So, are you assuming that somehow the similarity function, the distance function, is kind of known to say this underlying neural circuit that is performing this operation? Or Here it's just an inner product. Right, but are you assuming that talking about the brain, right? But somehow that similarity function is built in. Um... Right. So the goal of the reason why I had to redo the clustering from the bottom up is that we want to uh, do it in a way that a neural network could do with local learning rules. So we can do this kind of similarity. We cannot do a Gaussian kernel, for example. I don't know how to do a Gaussian kernel. Um, so, so uh, I mean, your clustering needs just one input, but your similarity, similarity function needs two inputs. So is the one input in the similarity function a, a, a prototype or...? No, no. Uh, this is applied to a pair of inputs. Okay? Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Okay. So what I should have said is, let's forget about the online requirement for a second. We will just derive the objective function and then we'll do it online. And surprising as it is, even though the objective is derived in the offline setting, we will be able to come up with an online algorithm. Okay? So I, I guess I'm confused that yes. classifi for classification, I just need just one, in the end, once the system has been trained, I need just yeah. one point in input space, and then I can tell is it this or that class. Right. But if I refer to similarity, I need two points in order to calculate the similarity. You are correct. So I can say these, these two points are close to each other or these are far apart, but it doesn't, uh, there's something missing you're, that you're, allows me clustering. You are absolutely correct. And that's why similarity things, it seems like a very counterintuitive concept to use for online clustering. Because you would need to compare with every other stimulus, in fact. Right? Just the centroid. So, huh? Just with the centroid. Exactly. So, so what we are doing now is we're just deriving the objective, not worrying about the online for a second. 
So, okay, so imagine that all the data is up there. the second X, is that then a, a representative prototype or central? Uh, yes. Yeah. Imagine, yeah. Imagine, okay. imagine that you have all the data points, right? So here we're just looking at two, but we'll have all the data points. I just want to derive an offline objective that will give you a clustering solution. Okay. So essentially you are making the point that basically used in the manifold learning that, you know, Euclidean space only, the Euclidean space, uh, the Euclidean distance globally doesn't make sense, but locally it makes a lot of sense. So this is like the zero, like order approximation to a geodesic. Yes. If there are three or more clusters, and then if they're dissimilar, it doesn't tell you very much about where they should be put, right? That's true. In hard clustering, they're just orthogonal assignment factors, so it doesn't tell you much, yes. Okay, so anyway, so we want to threshold. So what kind of objective would give me this kind of thresholding operation? Well, this is one, okay? So we're going to maximize with respect to this assignment uh, indices uh, whose norm is limited to one. Uh, and the uh, components would have to be non-negative, this kind of expression, okay? It's easy to verify that this indeed does what we want to do. If the similarity is greater than alpha, the parenthesis is positive, and that means to maximize this, we choose the maximum value of the inner product of y's, which is one, of course, because their norm is one, but that means that the y's are aligned, that means they belong to the same cluster, okay? So that's this part. If uh, similarity is less than alpha, the parenthesis is negative, we want to uh, choose uh, uh, inner product of y's as low as possible uh, because the components are non-negative, the best way to do it would be to set them orthogonal that is assigned to different clusters. I see. So this is summed over t and tau basically. This is sum. Okay, so at this point, these are just two points, and for two points, it will give you what we want. The question is, will it work for the whole data set? Can we just sum over t and tau? That's not an easy question to answer because you see the same yt <coughs> is used in different pairs, of course. So the different inner products are actually not independent. And that's why it's not clear whether it will work or not. But it turns out that it's pretty easy to prove a theorem that if it so happens that um, the Similarity between um, all the pairs within the same clusters are greater than alpha, and similarities of any two points from different clusters are less than alpha, then indeed the solution will work. So you just set the positive elements of the input similarity to the max, the negative elements to the min, which is orthogonal, and out comes the cluster picture. Okay, of course, you would have to choose alpha. Such alpha doesn't always exist, of course, right? But if we assume that our data has well-segregated clouds, so that distances between points from different clouds are greater than distance between any pair of points within the same cloud, then such alpha exists, and we can cluster by um, just uh, solving this objective, okay? So then we can go from this um, you know, a uh, cartoon of that um, fMRI <coughs> of IT with animate and inanimate objects and cluster them, uh, have these two blocks of ones and zeros, meaning that we assigned all this stimuli to pets, these are two plants, and this could be represented by just two neurons because there are two categories, okay? So that's pretty straightforward. Um, what, but, but, you know, k-means would do that too. So why did we do all that? Well. We did all that because with this kind of objective function, we can actually solve this problem in an online setting. Even though, as Lawrence pointed out, uh, you need two uh, examples to compare, to uh, compute similarities. And they are not available at any given time step. You only get given, are given one, okay? You can still solve this problem. And the answer, as Tali suggested, it has to do with appearance of the centroids. The way the centroids appear is, oh, by the way, um, I, I forgot to say one more thing, that this constraint on the amplitude, on the norm of y, uh, is just here um, implemented by Lagrange multiplier z to make this biologically plausible. Uh, but it's basically the same problem. Okay, so how does this happen that we can just use centroids? Uh, this is the central line. 
Okay, so if you understand this, you understand similarity alignment. Basically, um, the tricky term here is this quartic term that has this different, uh, two different x's and two different y's. And we can transform it by bringing the sum over tau inside into this parenthesis and calling that sum uh, wyx. This immediately allows you to perform optimization online because this is such a big sum over many samples that you have seen, it doesn't really change much from time step to time step. And whenever you get a new stimulus, you can use wyx from the previous step. You don't really need to uh, know the current y tau. So all you have to do is then to uh, optimize a quadratic function with respect to yt, which is now the current stimulus that is available to you. There is a non-negativity constraint, and there is also this other term um, coming from alpha and from z. That's why the uh, actual iteration looks a little bit more complicated. But basically, what is happening here is uh, at, you can solve this uh, optimization at every time step for a given xt by a dynamics of neuronal activity in a reasonably looking, biologically looking neural network, okay? Because, um, so this quadratic, uh, sorry, this is not even quadratic term. This is um, linear term, bilinear, bilinear term, nice. sorry, uh, uh, results in just simply matrix um, vector multiplication that is naturally implemented if um, the activity vector is um, carrying the components of x. And then the matrix W uh, consists of synaptic weights in this fit forward connections. So that would compute W times x, okay? Uh, now, this term arises from a cross term between y and z through the same kind of trick. Um, and it has to do with the normalization of the uh, assignment indices, and it can be implemented by representing z by the activity of one other neuron, which is naturally viewed as interneuron, inhibitor interneuron, because of the minus here. Okay? And then the synaptic weights from that interneuron to the um, principal neurons will be wyz's, okay, which are also this correlations between yz, so it's Hebian. And um, the threshold here has to do with the summed past activity b and the uh, parameter alpha, which um, sets the threshold on similarity, okay? So then whenever a new stimulus uh, arrives, um, it goes into this network. Each neuron pro uh, computes a summed, um, a produce, uh, computes a weighted sum of the feed forward inputs and feedback from the inhibitor interneurons, thresholds it, which is ne what neurons love to do, right? And then produces the output, which also goes into the interneuron, which does very similar thing, and, and that whole activity iterates, okay? So what is Z here? So Z is the uh, activity of this interneuron. But how do you compute it? I mean, oh, okay, sorry, I didn't write it down, but um, Z would be just, so, so what you do, you just take a derivative of, of that with respect to, um, Z and you would get something like Z T is um, is um, Z T plus gamma W Y Z uh, Z Y Y T um, minus theta. I think there is a threshold um, which comes from the which comes from this term. And WZY comes from another... And WZY is uh, the same kind of correlation that we had for YX. So what determines the number of clusters? Um, uh, just the architecture of the network, how many, how many neuron, principal neurons we assigned. So it also turns out that you don't really have to um, be very accurate. You can um, 
uh, produce an overabundance, you can build a network with an overabundant number of uh, neurons, and then they will uh, get activated when needed. Okay, so you don't really have to be very concerned about that. There are all kinds of regularizations that you can do to have that done automatically. Uh, so, so you draw this like disease and inhibitory population, but are you saying that WYZ and WXY are, are all positive or negative? Or like right, it? so because Ys and Zs have to be non-negative, any correlation of Y and Z would be positive, okay? So then these vectors, th this synapses have positive weights, and the reverse synapses, which are just the transpose of that matrix, come in with the minus in the dynamics, so this will be all negative. The fit forward ones depend, about what you, depend on what you assume about x. If x is also non-negative, then they're all non-negative. So if uh, you're concerned about local learning and, and, and things such as this, the, does it concern you that, for example, you have uh, the transpose of the weights being in some other place? In other words, you have... Yeah. Right. So um, that, no, that is not a major concern because actually um, the rule is still Hebbian. Uh, so you don't have to, um, you, you you just, don't have to worry about it. And... Yeah, you just run it and, and um, it all uh, comes out fine. Uh, in reality, they may not be exactly the same numerically, but um, yeah. Okay. And of course, okay, after... Um, the, the activity dynamic settles um, for each stimulus presentation, you have to update the synaptic weights because there is a new term in this sum. The covariance um, uh, has to be updated by the uh, ad additional term. Okay, and this learning rule is of course local, so you know, biologically plausible Hebbian uh, or anti Hebbian synapses. So that's basically the main idea of similarity alignment. So if for a certain family of objective functions that are written in terms of similarity, this trick works like a charm and churns out various biologically plausible Hebbian and anti Hebbian networks. Um, and when you require non-negativity, that also corresponds to rectification in neurons. Now, I, probably for this audience, I don't have to defend Hebbian synapses. But let me just show you know, one paper that uh, very clearly demonstrates this is the case. You know, this is the correlation between the activity of two neurons in the cortex, and this is the synaptic weight between them. Okay, so that's, um, of course, as expected. Uh, now, the next question, okay, now that we built this network, uh, does it really do what we want it to do? Does it really cluster? So let's throw this easily clusterable data set on that network, of course, you have to realize that the network has not been pre-trained, okay? So you start with some kind of virgin network with, you know, initialized randomly or whatever, and you just keep throwing those data points in it in an arbitrary order, and it just clusters the whole data set. Okay. So again, the number of clusters is determined by the size of the layer. Yeah, so here we just took uh, the same, but we, we do have regularizations that automatically choose the number of clusters. Yeah. So if, if you choose, if, if you start with more hidden units and yeah. clusters, the regularization will set some to zero. But suppose you start with fewer. Zero, uh, there, there are both possibilities, yes. Yeah, if you start with fewer, then they will uh, merge certain clusters. So the, the split of the cluster, this is the interesting thing, where a new cluster is born. That's right. What happens then? There's a phase transition in the, in the layer. Uh, so, so because it's online, the only thing that we see is that, you know, initially when you show the first data point, first neuron is activated, then when you show the second one, if the second data point is sufficiently close to the first, then that first neuron represents it. If it's not sufficiently close, then another neuron gets activated. And this process gets repeated. Is alpha an external parameter? Yes, alpha has to be set. <coughs> yeah, it was a related question to that, which is that what is setting the scale of the clusters? If you have more cells than clusters, you would have that's alpha. Data, that's alpha. 
It's alpha, yeah. right? So that's yeah. kind of like a fixed. Yeah, you have to you have okay, to so set. If you have clusters in clusters and some sort of hierarchical data, you are right. going to find. Um, not with this no, simple. Not with this. It. Not with this simple network. That's true. Do you think that it's absolutely necessary for this to work? That there is some feedback, perhaps, from the next hierarchical state, a signal that would basically tell you, no, 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 you didn't cluster this correctly. You yeah. thought it is a cat, but it's not a cat. It's a, it's a partner. Yeah. And you know. Yeah. And and in my opinion, this is what feedback is for. And. I, Oh. Yeah, I don't think I'm very original about that, but yes, exactly. And if I may, one more question. So, um, as I see this, I, I think about cortical columns and whether this circuit that you're describing here is essentially what happens in layer four. Like uh, the inputs exist there, the cortical <coughs> inputs exist there. Have you thought about this possibility that essentially that clustering happens in the cortical column of layer four? Well. Um, it may, but I have to warn you because this is an oversimplified cartoon of the cortical network. In a minute, I will show you what we think is the most reasonable biological um, implementation of this, which is the insect mushroom body, um, which I think is actually suits this very well. Um, but I think cortex is a little bit more complicated, so not ready to go on a limb. How strictly is your output orthogonalized after this? I mean, the y vectors. Y vectors, how strictly? So in this case, this is hard clustering. So only one neuron is non-zero in response to right. any it's stimulus. Always giving you this kind of noise so it's always orthogonal, OK? So there's no residual structure. There's about. no structure. Now, it is possible to actually do soft clustering with it. It's very easy. You just you add a, a L2 regularizer on Y to the objective function. And then you have multiple neurons uh, respond to each stimulus. And then the orthogonality <coughs> is lost. And that's what you can use to represent uh, hierarchical structures or manifolds. We'll get to that in the second part. Uh, two questions. So in the original equations, so in the early equations, it appeared to me that the Y vectors are sort of just chosen appropriately for the x vectors. And then this network structure somehow suggests that the y vectors are actually computed from the x vectors. Yep. So are the y vectors now just chosen? Uh, no, no. So when I try to motivate going on from when I tried to motivate the objective function, I said, what y do we want? Yes. But the network has, of course, to compute y on the fly for each stimulus. Yeah, OK. Second question, so this wyx, that contains, in principle, all the data that the network has seen. Yes. So if you have a changing statistics, well, uh, then you have to that's right. that somehow. Right? That's right. This is a sufficient statistics for this, uh, right? But if there's non-stationarity, then, you know, you have have whatever. Term, whatever right? right? I mean, this is not, this is not um, I mean, because online. Clustering, yeah. clustering very often, the clustering in the beginning is somewhat wrong. And that gets yeah. corrected. And if you don't get rid of the first examples, you 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 you, you keep this. So yeah, so it's very easy to yeah, it's very easy to build in forgetting into this. Yeah. So we have learning rules with forgetting, and then they can track the changing statistics. Yeah. So that's um, uh, that's fine as long as your setting is statistical rather than adversarial. This works just fine, mm -hmm. and in practice, it works all the time. Does, does this recurrent network have to iterate over time, or like, do you like let it converge? Or yes. Like? Yeah. So for each stimulus presentation, uh, the network has to iterate to compute Ys. And I realize that this feature is somewhat unbiological. So now we have derived networks that do not have to iterate. So that is actually uh, possible, at least for linear networks. But I'm not talking about this in, in the talk. It feels like maximum likelihood um, to me. If you had sort of exemplars that where the distributions overlap, then you're going to cut them, cut them along the equal probability yeah. bound. Yeah, you will. In fact, the reason this clusters is because it's not that different from k-means, which in turn can be thought of, you know, um, uh, what is it, Gaussian model expectation maximization, right? So. Um, so the, it is it is related to what you said, um, but let me just show. So so everyone recognizes this as a k-means objective function, okay? But just by 
some algebra, I can get rid of the Ws, right? Because they're just centroids of corresponding clusters. And I can get this expression, where the constraint, again, is this Lagrange uh, multiplier term. And instead of this, I have this thing, which, look, this is the, the, the cross term from the similarity in Y to similarity in X. The only difference from what I was just telling you before is this normalization by the sum of Y. Okay? So it is possible to rewrite a K-mean subjective function in terms of this, in this similarity looking form, and then you have a network with biological um, learning rules that actually performs clustering. So it's not really that surprising that this does as well as K-means, okay? But, but I thought, we seem to took a right angle term from my question, which was... Oh, then so I didn't the, understand. Well, the, there's a big faction of people that think um, Bayesian representations are, yeah. are the way the brain yeah. works. And so in that, I'm, I'm, I'm stumbling on to see how these the complete overlapping distribution yeah. that get represented right. in your clustering algorithm. Right, so I don't, I don't have a slide on that, uh, but basically if you do the following, you just add to this the term, which is um, you know, plus trace of Y transpose Y in the matrix okay. notation, okay? okay? Um, that kind of L2 regularization on top of K means will turn it into soft clustering. Okay. And then for each data point, you can activate multiple neurons to a different rate. You can associate that uh, or interpret this as probabilities of assigning that data point to a particular cluster. And that's actually important, right? So that, I think, uh, makes a lot of sense. I just didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. OK? So we can do soft k-means. And because we could do clustering, we looked for a biological network the your actual you know, um, network that could implement something like this. And what we found, we think, is the best um, option that um, could be modeled by uh, clustering is um, operation of the mushroom body in an insect. So just a brief, um, a brief review of olfactory system. So most of animals, the way they smell is that they have dedicated neurons whose receptors are tuned to particular compounds. And so there are many of them, like we have maybe 200 different ones. And the uh, fly has 50, and uh, um, you know, m mouse has 1,000. Uh, so so there's, here I'm just showing just two. So there's a different kind of um, dimensions of the olfactory space. And after the preliminary processing in the insect, it's called antenna lobe which would be olfactory bulb in the mammal, it's going to, uh, information is transmitted to the part called the mushroom body, which has several characteristics that makes us think that our model would work just great there. There is a huge divergence from, say, 50 channels to 5,000. Um, there is only one inhibitory interneuron for the whole um, set of 5,000 mushroom body Kenyan cells. This is surprising by itself, but this is also has been one of the problems with the existing model of processing there, because if you apply, for example, sparse dictionary learning here, um, it's very hard to do it with a single interneuron. But for clustering, of course, you want just a single interneuron, because what that interneuron does, it just makes sure that the norm of the assignment index vector is, doesn't exceed one. That's the only job, the only constraint which is a scalar constraint that it has to implement, and that's why it's a single interneuron. So that's what we are proposing. And of course, um, we can explain then a lot of um, features, right? So it makes sense that neurons um, are rectifiers, right? Because um, the assignment indexes are non-negative, right? There is no sense of having a negative to belong to some cluster with a negative weight, right? Even if you have a probabilistic assignment, okay, probabilities are non-negative. So actually, that's why we think neurons are r rectifiers in general, because they represent um, assignment indices to different clusters. Um, as I mentioned, we can account for a single giant interneurons. Um, you get sparse over complete representation, of course, because um, you want to have many different clusters in the olfactory space that could correspond to different uh, stimuli. 
uh, sparsity arises from the competition, and if you have competition plus non-negativity, a lot of the components have to be zeros. <coughs> and of course, this predicts non-random connectivity, which went against initial experimental measurements in that system, but are now confirmed by connectomics. What happens if that giant interneuron dies? Seems very unstable. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there is an experiment where they ablated or shut down that interneuron, and they showed that um, recognition of orders became worse. I, I don't remember. I think this is uh, uh, Misen, Misen, Misenbach, maybe. What do you mean by orders? Orders? Oh, orders. Yeah. Well, sorry. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> is, there actually some, some, uh, so what, is there evidence that actually some clustering goes, goes on in this system? I mean, there's these other models where you actually just this kind of, you know, they, they yes. spread out yeah. and <coughs> yeah. learn. It, I mean, is right. there really an unsupervised clustering going Yeah, on? so the, the, the experiment that suggests that it's more clustering than um, compressive sensing yeah. is um, the fact that there are neurons, there are Kenyan cell neurons, that do not respond to uh, pure components of the mixture, but respond to the mixture. Right? That wouldn't be the case in a compressive sensing of you. So and that has been reported before by Gilles Laurent and others. Really also mix, right? No, no, but, but so what I'm saying is that this neuron will not respond to order A, will not respond to order B, but it will respond to A plus B. And that looks to me more like clustering than like compressive sensing. Um, just to put uh, nine questions about the mushroom body. Is that the only interneuron out there, or is there also local interneurons? This is the only interneuron there. Right? It's called giant interneuron. And all the other excitatory cells? <laughs> yes. So this circuit is actually a somewhat of an oversimplification, but this one, um, well, this part of the circuit is actually pretty accurate. There's more complication going on with the output when actions are decided and so on, and you know uh, learning takes place. But the the input is is like that. It is really true, as confirmed by connectomics. And be careful when you think about insects and invertebrate neurons because you know you might have like a lot of the neurons are monopolar. And there's a cell body, right. but then there's this very elaborate dendritic tree. And it's not necessarily mm. true that this dendritic tree mm. isn't like necessarily, in, you know, it, it could right. be like multiple little right. inhibitory. It's not right. isopotential. It's right. not necessarily so, isopotential. So this is, this is a very good point. And that possibility has been considered. And there has been a debate in the community whether this interneuron acts as one or these are localized um, computations. And the latest data that I've heard about is that it has been proven that it acts as one. Okay, but that's an experimental finding. Of course, I cannot claim that theoretically. So back to the question of scale and the cluster geometries. Yeah. Is there reason to think that different orderants and order mixtures have similar size scale clusters or the cluster geometries of the compact blobs, or could they be manifolds? Or uh... um, they are probably manifolds, but that's why this talk has part two, although um, I don't have that much time left. OK? Um, all right. OK, so now um, that's all I had to say about simple clustering. Um, uh, is there anyone who have not seen the solution? OK, so you're supposed to see young woman or old woman, um, even though the, you know, this is the same, the same image, right? The same vector in the pixel intensity space. This is, of course, a visual illusion, but it uh, is here to emphasize the point that two objects that are very similar in the pixel space could actually belong to completely different uh, classes and live on different manifolds in this high dimensional space, like animate and inanimate. And you know, going back to this illustration from Car De Carlo and Cox, right? Um, then the way to view the visual system is um, that layer after layer of visual processing is trying to disentangle these manifolds without destroying their internal structure so that you can learn very easily from very few examples by linear classification. And because you did not destroy the structure of the manifolds, you can generalize. Right? So that's one way to think about 
object categorization and visual processing, right? And this is, of course, uh, what we really need to do, right? Clusters, you know, belonging to animate and inanimate in the pixel space, they are not well segregated. They're probably more like this. Of course, the manifolds don't really intersect. They look intersecting here because the projection onto low dimensional space. Still, they're highly entangled. You have to pull them apart. Well, if you want to pull apart those manifolds, perhaps some kind of manifold learning technique will work, which preserves neighborhood relationships between nearby points, but tries to pull the manifolds apart. And there are many respectable methods in uh, you know, manifold learning um, uh, that uh, work reasonably well, uh, but in my view, all of them lack biological plausibility. And the biggest problem here is that they, uh, it's very difficult to formulate them in the online setting, because most of these methods work in the following way. You, compute, you take the whole data set, you compute the affinity matrix between all the stimuli into a graph, and then you perform a spectral analysis of that graph. And so when the new point comes about, um, you have to recompute the whole graph. Uh, that doesn't work in the online setting. So uh, what, what can we do? Well, we thought, well, since we built our network to preserve neighborhood relationships, maybe it can do this manifold disentangling. So we took our network and through this cartoon of entangled manifolds, right? So now there's two clusters. Uh, they're, of course, not labeled. It's unsupervised. But they cannot be linearly classified, right? So what's going to happen? Um, well, first of all, nothing good is going to happen if you use this original objective function that I showed you, because this describes similarity in terms of just in a product. And if you put an origin here, then these points on the same axis will be indistinguishable, even though they belong to different um, uh, manifolds, because uh, the inner products uh, just depend on the angle between the points. So you have to rewrite it in terms of the Euclidean distances. It seems my, may seem like a major um, problem for neurally, biologically plausible networks, but actually we know how to build a neural networks that um, process distances, not just similarities. So that's not a big deal. So we built a neural network that optimizes this objective, and out come this um, um, not very nice result because what the network did, there are just two neurons in the output and they just uh, tear, up the, um, tear up the data set depending on the value of alpha. You can you know, get more points uh, assigned to different uh, clusters, but that's all they do. They're not learning manifolds. So, so we're, we're invited to pretend we've <coughs> never heard of Support vector machines or anything like that. Well, we want something to be neurally plausible, right? Well, it's a linearity. Everything is linear here. I mean, no, there is a, uh, a rectification. Yeah, you're yeah, but yeah. there's no you need embedding in some high dimension. Well, so the high dimension part is right on. If we add more neurons, if you don't just use two neurons for two clusters, but we learn, I think in this case, we have to use 40 neurons or so then miracle occurs. So those neurons actually learn receptive fields that tile the two manifolds, OK? And each neuron represents only data points from one or the other <coughs> manifold. So this network can, in fact, learn manifolds, OK? And because um, the, the neurons are either represented one manifold or the other. In the next layer, you could just linearly classify it with uh, some supervision. Okay? Just to put this data in a little bit more, uh, in the um, format a little bit more familiar to neuroscientists, um, here is, I just colored the data points here by uh, the neuron that represents that data point that activates in response to that data point. I didn't have as many colors as there are neurons, OK? So you see the same color repeating, but that's just an artifact, OK? They do tile the manifold with contiguous receptive fields. Of course, if you show this to neuroscientists, you immediately think of place cells, right? And so if you, if you turn your giant interneuron a little bit down so that you get actually a distributed sparse representation, what happens? 
Right. So, um, so this doesn't have to be hard clustering. Okay. So depending on that L2 norm regularizer that I talked about, you can change the degree of sparsity. And you can make this clustering soft. And you can make receptive fields of different neurons overlap. In fact, they do in this realization. You can see that, um, well, where is it? Uh, like, look here. OK, they're clearly overlapping. But you still don't get uh, the disconnected components. No, you don't. OK? But I will get to it in a couple more slides. OK? So, um, so what, what similarity alignment seems to be able to do is not just to cluster, but to learn manifolds. OK? So then we went on a. Uh, theoretical soul search and trying to understand what's going on. And what helped me a lot is um, knowing about the paper uh, that was published by Cho and Sol in 2010, where what they suggested is that neural networks uh, can, can be built to compute kernels, local kernels just like radial basis functions, except that they um, showed uh, by just performing exact mathematical calculation that a single layer network, and um, okay, they use F instead of Y, but it's a single layer network like ours, except that the number of units is infinite, the number of output units is infinite, and the weights are randomly chosen from a Gaussian distribution. They're not learned, they're randomly chosen from a Gaussian distribution, so this is like random projections. Okay, and the neurons are rectifiers with any of those activation functions. Okay, linear rectifiers or other rectifiers. So if you have a network like this and you present stimuli after stimuli, the output that network gives can be thought of as a kernel computation, meaning that the inner product of the output activities for two stimuli T and T prime <coughs> depends on the angle between those input vectors T and T prime once they've been normalized, theta, in this way. So it's non-negative, and it goes to zero for orthogonal vectors. Okay? So you get a significant uh, kernel only if the two vectors are close to each other. So just like for Gaussian RBF kernel. Except they called it R cosine kernel because they, exact, they could compute this integral exactly and show that it's given by a closed form R cosine expression. Okay, uh, and different shapes of a kernel are uh, produced by different kinds of nonlinearities. Okay, so where does this kernel come from? Okay, it's very easy to understand because to have a non-zero in a product, you have to have components of F that is neuron that is active uh, with response to different stimuli. Okay, which Ws respond to a given stimuli because of rectification to respond to stimulus Xt this W has to sit in this half circle, okay? And to uh, have a non-zero activation in response to a stimulus T prime, um, this W has to sit in the green half circle. So the number of Ws that respond uh, is given by the area of the intersection. And that area, of course, decays on the angle. So that's the basic idea of how rectification leads to the locality in the kernel sense. Okay? So what we did in this context is we got rid of the requirement that you need an infinite number of randomly generated synaptic, infinite number of neurons and randomly generated synaptic weights by learning synaptic weights through the data. So our kernel is not present from the beginning. The kernel is being learned from the data as the data arrives in the online way, but the idea of what's going on is, is exactly like Cho and Sol described for random projections. Because we can learn from the data, we don't need infinitely <coughs> many neurons. We don't need to spend the whole space, ambient space of stimuli with centroids. We can only put the centroids, the Ws, only where the data lives. So the centroids will spend the same manifold, the same low dimensional manifold on which the data lives. That's why when Clay talked about computing um, em embedding for Ws, they form a low dimensional space because they live in the low dimensional manifold where data lives. 
Okay. Um, all right, so just one more theoretical result. Of course, you know, words are good, and I appeal to this random projection uh, or result of Chu and Sol, but can we actually prove that our network will really do that? And in fact, we can. We have to take advantage of symmetry. So for a data set which uniformly spans a circle, for example, as a function of theta, we can solve an optimization function exactly and show that uh, the receptive fields are bump, the bumps, the localized bumps, like you saw numerically. Um, this is possible because you can rewrite the problem in, uh, as, as convex optimization using compositive matrices. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but some of you will recognize the solution. The solution is that activation of each neuron for the continuous uh, representation is simply a threshold cosine. Okay? So these would be the place fields of individual neurons um, indexed by their centroid phi. And we can show that these are exactly cosines. Amazingly, this is the same math as for the ring attractor. It's exactly the same math, but the interpretation is completely different. In, in, um, in uh, um, the ring attractor, these are individual neurons that interact with each other. Here, these are data points that interact with each other in the data space um, through this uh, computation. Okay? Well, you do dot products, so it's not really surprising that you get cosine. Okay. But it, took, it took some, it, it's actually uh, Einer von Singup to derive this, so it, it took work. But, but there is now an exact solution that shows that this is what our network does. It does learn these kernels, cosine kernels, in a data dependent way, uh, just as promised. And just to throw uh, some eye candy, you know, we can learn not just uh, place fields, we can start with place fields and based on correlations for this uh, synthetically moving animal, we can actually get grid cells. Um, I mean, that may not be that surprising, but we are doing it with the network just with Habian learning rules. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more why you get uh, place cells? Um, or grid cells, I'm sorry. No, so grid cells, I cannot say much more other than think about, you know, there was no uh, no negativity constraint. This would be simply PCA, like linear multidimensional uh, multidimensional scaling. So you would get uh, Fourier harmonics. Once you get non-negativity, you get something slightly different, but you keep the periodicity. So that's all I can say at the moment. It's a clustering of the uniform sphere. Yeah. yeah. And you don't have choice. Okay. All right. And of course, you know, we, we passed the um, Olshausen and Field test. We can learn Gabor patches from natural images. Um, but the big, of course, the big prize is can we really stack those layers to get from here to there? We don't know yet. We think we can. Uh, I want to show one example where we uh, have been successful with stacking. And that's an example of this. Uh, cartoon of entangled manifolds using the spirals. Again, the network is completely unsupervised, so it doesn't see the red-blue color. It just gets those data points. And this is the similarity matrix of the input. Once you pass it through the first layer, it unfolds the manifolds, okay? And it sees the two separate manifolds. If you keep stacking our network on top, after the sixth layer, the two clusters actually get pulled apart. Okay? Of course, what you need to do for that is you need to reduce the number of neurons in the representation as you go along, right? You have to have this funnel that leads to just two clustered neurons. Remember, when we tried to apply a network with just two neurons to the uh, original data, nothing good happened, okay? But when we did it gradually, layer after layer, reducing the number of neurons, then this clustering did happen. Of course, we have to go to such lengths only because we require this to be completely unsupervised. If you allow just a little bit of supervision, you could cluster after the first layer because um, there is already one dimension along which red and blue are separated. It's just not in one of the top uh, eigenvalues, so you wouldn't get it from spectral clustering. But if you knew if you had some supervised um, input, you could. Okay? Well, spectral clustering solves this. Uh Problem. It does solve this, but you have to first compute an affinity graph with the Gaussian kernel. 
and I don't know how to do this neurally. Okay? So this is our way, this is our workaround to do um, manifold learning or kernel analysis in an online um, biologically plausible way with cabin networks. Okay? I don't, initially we thought it's just a way to make things biological. Now I'm starting to think that there is maybe something fundamentally useful to that kind of approach where you compute the kernel on the fly and the graph is being recomputed in the online fashion rather than doing it a priori as is done conventionally. But I would be happy to talk about it. Uh, question? Yeah. So this is an empirical thing, right? Yeah. Or is it's an empirical reason? Yeah. You just ran it and it... Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. But you, you didn't show that this actually will always, you know, like theoretic. I mean, what I'm saying is, instead of just running it, why don't you show that it... Um, I, I think we could do that. I mean, we th this result that, you know, our first theoretical result that actually shows that we get this kernel um, is relatively new. Okay. Um, so, so I think we should be able perhaps to extend it to that case. But yeah, that's a good question. So to do something hard, uh, if you take six layers to do something that's easy, do you think you'll have to get very deep? to do image categorization or something? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, in, in, well, okay. I don't know what it takes to do image categorization because I don't think that the visual system just repeats this one operation that I just described, which is similarity alignment. I think there is something else, right? Because you have to learn invariances and stuff like that. So there are other things that need to be done which we don't know how to do at least not in a biologically plausible way, right? So and then I don't know how many layers you need. But I want to point out, I mean, this may be a little bit of a red herring because, you know, the, the real computation is kind of done here, okay? The manifolds are learned here. All the other layers are doing are, are pulling, to, to are pulling those yeah. manifolds apart in a very inefficient way. If you had just a little bit of feedback, a little bit of a supervised signal, you could just do it in a two-layer network very easily, okay? Where you just, you know, the first um, layer computes these features, and the second layer is the, just a perceptron. You're done, okay? But for completely unsupervised, this is what you have to do. So I'm not sure it's a really uh, very, very good model of stacking in the visual system. But that's as far as we got, so. Oh, but again, this dimension reduction in the unsupervised case, it's not clear that this is what uh, you actually need. I mean, in this case, it's, it's really just the geometrical disconnected components. But I may want something completely different. Exactly. So, exactly. And, uh, exactly. So, so, you would, so if I'm talking about model of the brain, I would stop here. Right? And then I would do something else at this stage. And maybe then stack again. So just as a discussion point, so Dan Yemens and uh, Jen Carlo, they train these big feed-forward networks with backprop and then compare the internals of those before networks to areas like uh, before, right? And it can ex explain variance. And so in conversation with Dan, uh, he pointed out that if the object recognition portion of that task in order to make those correspondences with data is actually critical. And if you do the same, um, <coughs> the same analysis, but instead use a feed forward network that was trained as an autoencoder, that the autoencoding network does a significantly worse job of explaining the variation in neural data. Well, but I, I, I don't find that surprising, right? Because, uh, okay, so you have two networks, right? One does natural object categorization. The other one does artificial object categorization. But where do the categories come for the artificial network? These are the same categories that we perceive that are presumably <laughs> represented in IT. So then you have two networks where both the inputs are the same and the targets are the same. So I brought it up because it struck me that you, were, maybe I misunderstood, yeah. that you were motivating a sort of stacked, unsupervised structure, at least in some analogy to... No, 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 no not at all. That's what, why I was saying. This is just a way to show that we can do this clustering. We can pull the manifolds apart. But the biologically relevant part, I think, ends here. Okay. So 
um, in the title you said uh, um, that you would sort of link structure, function, and what was the third model? So computation. So? Computation. So can you elaborate a, a little bit on that? Because I mean, so I was somehow, I mean, I, when I went into this talk, I was somehow right. thinking, okay, okay, you look at connectomics and models, and I mean, also your introduction sounded like that, and now it's more like a self-contained model. So where's the linkage to uh, Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so all these predictions of, you know, Ws, I don't know what, what's good, you know, the predicted Ws, that there, you know, this that we can compute the Ws by uh, actually analyzing this data set. That's something that is can be tested, and the, in fact, we are testing this in the olfactory system, where we have the full connectome. But the problem is that we don't have the true uh, natural image data set in olfaction, mm -hmm. right? So we're trying to do it with the data we have, and we have some preliminary indication of success. But it was too too um, too premature to actually talk about it. I felt, but so that but that's what we are doing. So you always said the W relates to a connectome. That's right. So W can be measured by connectomics, but it can also be predicted by measuring activity in that circuit. Okay, and then activity can also be predicted the same way from W. So the, this this theory allows you. I don't know which. Which, uh, ah, maybe this slide would be the best. Um, sorry for uh, flashing this so quickly. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is a computational objective that ties you to what you want to do, like cluster and manifold learning. The Ws are expressed in terms of activities, so they can be related to activities. They can also be measured through connectomics. And of course, Ys and Xs are activities of neurons that can be measured by large scale. Uh, neuronal population recordings, like with calcium imaging, for example. So this this ties together. That that's what I. Thanks for the question. Actually, yeah. This ties together all these three different levels of analysis: two experimental and one theoretical. So another place to look would be the inputs to the cerebellum, the mossy fibers. They go to these glomeruli, and then from there to the parallel fibers. And it's thought that there is some kind of feature extraction. Yeah. And, and since this is feed forward with an inhibition, just like you get yep. in, the, in that structure, uh, you, you, you might be able to have another yep. place to uh, yep. you know, look at it. But the, by the way, the other thing is uh, how, how well does it scale in terms of the numbers, right? Uh, if, I mean, you know, there's, uh, it said that there's 10 billion neurons in the brain, of which 100 billion are in the right. cerebellum, right? right? And most of those are granule cells. Right. So it, 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 can it scale up to 100 billion, do you think? Well, we, we, we don't know. Um, on, on a laptop, we can run up to you know, a few thousands. Um, but I don't see why not. All right. I mean, the, the, only, the only thing that I find a little bit um, problematic for such scaling is this uh, iterative um, settling of activity. So we are trying to get rid of it. Well, but, but, but it's also, you, you're not going to have one inhibitory neuron for the whole brain. Yeah. Right. So, so I, in this talk, just for simplicity, I only talked about the similarity alignment with a single in, interneuron. But we also have other mathematical expressions that give multiple interneurons. And those multiple interneurons may be disconnected from each other or may mutually inhibit each other, as also happens. So um, actually, that's, that's my final. Uh, Mitchell, do you think you can incorporate this balance exhibition and inhibition into your your model? Yeah. Uh, oops, sorry. So, sorry, just just to answer. So, these are different um, biological features that we can capture in this by changing terms and writing down a slightly different uh, computational objective. Um, so, you know, the giant interneurons, what I talked about uh, today, but we can also do. Um, yeah, it's not, yeah, so, so we can also do multiple interneurons with anti habian rules. Um, so it's, it's all possible in, in um, yeah, other kinds of interneurons with other learning rules. Um, sorry, so the question was, uh, I mean, it, is, it does have to be all balanced. I'm not sure it will pass the, the exact definition of a balanced network in the sense of Sampolinsky and company, 
But keep in mind that this is not like a recurrent network that we are working with here. It's mostly a feed-forward network where recurrency is only um, a feedback inhibition. So it, it's, not, it's not really the kind of network for which balanced excitation inhibition was um, uh, shown, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Misha, the, uh, uh, the comment about not having to kernelize uh, to relate to manifold embedding schemes, in, in your updating rule, <clears throat> you have a W that appears in both terms. So, so you, you update the Ys, then you update the Ws, and then, then those Ws go back into the Ys. So you get this W squared. And in uh, the manifold learning world, there's a quadratic form of that sort uh, on distances. And so it may be the case that your scheme is working there because you're implicitly uh, uh, forming that nonlinear aspect, the relevant nonlinear aspect of the kernel by the two steps in your updating. Uh, we have to think about this. It's not immediately obvious to me, maybe. maybe. OK, so this is the most important slide. This is people who were involved in this work in different, at different stages. Um, and thank you very much. And actually, um, I'm missing Yang Shi Chen, who is, also should be on that slide, and it's my oversight. Can you go back to the first time you showed the okay, go ahead. spirals? <laughs> First time. Is this the first time? Or, yeah, we have like a bunch of them, like all of the, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, like, what happens if you like put a data point that's not on one of the spirals? Or like if you just, you know, sampled the whole two dimensional space, I mean, would you just have like a tile, would the neurons just tile this whole space? Yeah, so, so it depends where you put it. If you introduce small amount of noise, it will just work anyhow. Uh, but if you put it very far from it, then you may get a neuron that will represent just that data point. Or like, like after it's learned, you know, you, you train it with this. Oh, spiral. after it's learned? But oh, then, then it's, it's simple. It's, it's just a projection. You will try the, to find the, um, the, nearest, uh, the nearest centroids, and you will distribute activity among those centroids. Right, so like, right, so like this. So, we're not a so every neuron here is really. In hard like clustering, it's just we're annoyed. In soft clustering, it would be just like uh, maximum likelihood. So there's, like, there's like just like a circle at every. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, question. a question about the uh, the image coding example. So how do you how do you code the image then? Is it winner take all? I mean, is it just one unit that gets to respond for the whole image patch, or do you somehow soften it so that multiple units can? Oh, be we out? just uh, you mean when we learn Gabor patches? Yeah. Oh, just like you did, you know, just patches. It's uh, twelve by twelve patches. Right, I know, but now you have a population of neurons coding that. Yeah. yeah is um, can only one neuron? No, no, this was, OK, actually, to be, to be honest, this is soft clustering, but soft. not just that. It was a network, which we originally called similarity matching, which had multiple interneurons. Okay. So it's, uh, or, or maybe even, no, maybe even direct uh, connections. I see. Yeah. So that leads me to another question. There yeah. seems to be a strong, these qualitative similarity between this learning rule and Foldiax, yes. learning rule, which is like a mixture yes. of heavy and anti-heavy. Yes. I mean, what do you sort of? How, is there some way to? Uh, oh yeah, I, well, it's it's the same. So if you didn't have a nonlinearity, you know, for the linear one, um, you could just um, uh, we could can also derive a network like this, and the learning rules are very close to Foldex. I think for feed forward, they're exactly the same because these are just Oya's rules. For the he didn't have an interneuron. He had lateral right. connections. So for the lateral connections, we get slightly different learning rules. Our normalization term is different. Um, but remember that he did not derive his learning rules. He just numbers. postulated them. This was heuristic. And so it's nice that it worked. But you know, it's very hard to analyze the nature of the solutions. Ours are derived from a principled objective. So we can actually see what the solution will be. So that, that, I think, is the advantage. So this, in some ways, uh, resembles the self-organizing map. Yeah. And with a lot more, I think, uh, rigor and uh, theory behind it. 
But it, I think that in spirit, it's similar, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I even... Uh, you, you had it on the first slide. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a more principled and biologically plausible um, instantiation of uh, self organized map. So, uh, so the key thing that came out was that your update rule, uh, A, has to be online, and B, has to be rectified in year. So that would just automatically imply that the objective function, if you, if you were, if this came out from just doing gradient descent on the objective function, the objective function has to be quadratic with some positivity constraint. Um, so, so now, if so, if if you if, if, so, if you always think that neurons have to be so happy and not happy, then that means the only class of objective function you can solve is is this class. Uh, right, but it's a very big class. We now have a huge family of networks. I mean, even for clustering, right? I mean, we have this. We have this kind of objective, and we have. We so have so I, I don't disagree that it's th this class. kind of objective, right? And this is just like for clustering with a single interneuron. There are many, many more that we have, sure, right? I, so I it's it's a rich it's, class. Sure, it's rich, but but you're saying, you you don't think that's a big constraint? Say say now if I uh, want to optimize some you know e to the minus x or whatever, then uh, you know probably. So you're you're saying that biologically it's not necessary to consider okay. those sort of okay. Okay, so probably not necessary, okay. but at this point in time, these are the only ones for which we can make a connection from the objective to the online algorithm to the neural network with local learning rules. Okay. Once you write down a log or an exponential, which I, I would love to write them down, it becomes much trickier. And I'm not sure how to do this at the moment. So that's that's the reason, right? So you know, that's why we use Euclidean divergence rather than something else. So, so you mentioned this briefly about invariance. So let's take an endless digit, like one. If you uh, shift it just a little bit, uh, the similarity is zero, right? And so how would you think about that? So in the right. So um, you know, it depends how much data you have. If the data is sufficiently dense to you know, trace out a manifold in the pixel intensity space, then we will do just fine. But in your first layer, we get zero. So, oh, I see. There are different ones there. Well, there, there are sufficiently close ones that whose overlap is non-zero, and the network will learn that. Now, whether this is biologically plausible, or you need to invoke some other ideas, like uh, temporal correlation, slow feature analysis, or um, Whatever. Uh, I don't know. But certainly for very high density of data, we can learn those manifolds. So OK, so we will have a break. After the break, I think we will have, um, after the break, a discussion. And it will be the most energetic discussion I will have at the entire workshop, because it was just one talk. We are, you know, we are not near 5 o'clock. So uh, uh, but please think a little bit, what are the points, also the bigger picture points we want to, to, to discuss and, and figure out. You have heard now almost three quarters of the talks. And so I think it's now time to really think a little bit bigger picture and then, of course, dive into all the details where we disagree. And, but, uh, so, so enjoy the coffee and think a little bit about discussion points, too. We have some here. You know, the, 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 and so uh, we have lots of data now, right? Every talk is a data point in, in the space of all possible theories. And the question is, you know, how does that, how do we relate that to uh, a theory for, say, the cortex or the cerebellum? Uh, it, it's been, you know, theory, theory has been very thin in uh, biology and in, in neuroscience. Uh, on the whole, right, there, there's, uh, there are a few that we have, but uh, it would be nice to try to integrate across all of the, the different uh, approaches that we've heard, you know, is, is it the case that there is a theory emerging, or, or more than one, from, from all of the, all the data that's coming in that will come in that we can test?